Oftentimes, the Spanish Civil War is looked at as a war that was used to test the tactics and strategies used in World War II. However, surprisingly, several countries not only did not look fully into the Spanish Civil War to learn, but decided not to look into the Spanish Civil War at all. Now, Military History Visualized did a video already on this, but I found he focused mostly on the lessons learned around aerial combat. So today we are going to learn and discuss more of the tactical lessons on the ground, and particularly with urban combat. One of the most interesting tactics of the Spanish Civil War I noticed that was used was breaking through walls and the use of vertical dimension fighting. Oftentimes troops would either dig through the wall or they would blast a hole, throw grenades through, and then clear out the building from there. They would also sometimes use roofs of buildings in order to avoid the streets at, if possible. The purpose of this was to avoid entering the street obviously, which was often a death trap due to lack of cover and narrowness and setup of defensive positions covering the streets. What happened was that the fascists were so deeply entrenched that they made every single foot here at a costly expense to us. There was dead, our dead was every place. Every street had men laying dead on it. Uh, getting inside a house, getting them out of a house, the only way we could do it was punch a hole through the wall, throw a few hand grenades in there, blow that place up, punch the hole again, making, making it bigger, then go into the house, and by God, we did this hour after hour after hour, until finally, we was able to take one entire street. And uh, it was just, uh, you figure that on both sides, the, the, our men were doing it on that side, we're doing it on this side, we're taking the floor, we're getting into the basement, and we're, they're resisting every single place. So finally, after say four or five hours, we were able to take one whole street, and that was at a very expensive cost. I haven't found any particular manuals between or during World War II yet mentioning this, although a very similar tactic seems to have taken note from this. The use of vertical dimension fighting involved in similar techniques as seen in this British training film from 1941. Move unseen and undercover. What I find interesting in this is that this seems to have carried over to this day. On page 716 in the US Army's Combined Arms Operation and Urban Terrain Manual from June of 2011, it says, In high threat situations, avoid using ground floor windows and doors except as a last resort. Consider using other means available to make a breach hole for entry to include entry from a higher floor, a roof, or a basement. If the threat situation warrants it, the actual entry of soldiers should be preceded by hand grenade, fragmentation concussion, or a stun hand grenade, followed immediately by entry of the clearing team. And it goes on to include on page 725, many multi-story buildings have a roof access that soldiers can use to enter their building. These roof access points are typically stairs or permanently attached ladders. 
On buildings without roof access points, or if using established access point is not preferred, a hole can be made in the roof to gain entry. Basic hand tools can breach wood or shale type roofs, while concrete or other durable materials require an explosive breach. With regards to going through walls, it suggests the following procedure of going through a doorway if suspected of enemy personnel on the other side or traps. This suggests to explosively breach the door, in this case a wall. Some other interesting tactics that were developed and practiced during World War II in urban combat are not only hugging the walls of the buildings when going down roads, but also crossing roads in a straight line rather than diagonally. This was to minimize the time spent on the road, which would often be a kill zone as mentioned before for attackers. The British had an interesting way of crossing rapidly across side roads, en masse bunched up, which is comically bad. Currently, the USOEC GNV recommends crossing spread out at about 5 meters, one at a time, in order to decrease the chances of being hit while crossing the road. On the defensive, it is suggested by the OEC GNV also to try to avoid the muzzle of the firearm from poking out of windows, corners, or other holes in the walls and buildings to minimize muzzle flash or being easily spotted. However, I'm not sure if these tactics were implemented from the lessons of the Spanish Civil War or just from early urban combat from the early years of World War II or other even other combat scenarios. Now another interesting lesson around urban combat was about bombarding. Although there had been urban fighting before by industrial armies, the Spanish Civil War provided insight into the possible technologies and strategies of mostly fascist Italy, Germany, and the Social Soviet Union that would be used in World War II. Heavy bombardments of towns and cities were used particularly by the Nationalists. While some of you might note the Nationalists won the war, their bombardments resulted in a slower advance normally. The fact they already had well-disciplined and organized experienced soldiers who were well armed by both Germany and Italy helped significantly in their victory. But why did these bombardments slow down their advance or even halt forces from capturing an urban objective? One major issue is bubble and accidentally producing more obstacles and cover or concealment. As seen when attacking the Toledo Alcazar, Republican militias blew up sections but resulted in it being more difficult for them to assault and slowed it down enough for reinforcements to arrive for the Nationalists. Similarly, issues arose in battles with Belchite and battles within Madrid like over the University City. These obstacles would prevent tanks from going down certain routes or made them more vulnerable. These obstacles would also provide more cover and hiding spots for soldiers that heavy bombardment would be limited to mostly buildings or a few vehicles in prepared positions with perhaps sandbags, breastworks, or other barricades given time. One way in which militaries tried to prevent rubble or other obstacles caused by bombardment becoming traps for vehicles was to keep them behind advancing infantry or as a overwatch. The platoon should organize and practice to move as two forces, a maneuver force and an overwatch force. The maneuver force, normally of one squad on a narrow street or two squads on wider streets, moves forward, scouts dangerous areas, and closes with the enemy. An overwatch force, the remainder of the platoon and its attached or supporting crew served weapons, moves behind the maneuver force, secures the platoon's flanks and rear, and provides direct fire support when needed. These two forces can exchange roles from the time to time to avoid over-fatigue of the maneuver force. There is obviously another problem with bombarding an urban area, that of civilian casualties. With past documentaries or propaganda, the English were viewed as unique in their defiant response to the Blitz. However, this was not truly unique to the English. The bombings of Spanish cities and towns by nationalists, Italian, and German bombers resulted in similar defiance and also resulted in more volunteers to avenge those lost by the bombings 
and the homes lost to the bombings. The British and the American forces did not learn from this clearly, although France initially started taking lessons and reorganizing the Air Force based on this. However, if you want to focus more on the aerial lessons of the war, I suggest you watch this video, as it already covers most of the British, French, and American lessons in that regard. I will mention this though, that sums up the US and British response to the Spanish Civil War in regards to aerial bombardment. Several army officers offered the conclusion clearly unwelcomed to the Air Corps that strategic bombing of enemy cities and industries had no decisive effect in Spain, and civilian populations had quickly learned to adapt to bombardment from the air, a judgment that contradicted the theory of the popular air power prophet Duhuit. Currently, some lessons that were not learned from the Spanish Civil War for World War II seem to have slowly been implemented. Rather than long bombardments of only a sector suspected of enemies or industries, bombardments of a sector now include normally a short and heavy bombardment followed by a rapid assault. According to the Marine Manual, military operations on urbanized terrain or MOUT from April 1998 on page 222 section D, the attack of a built-up area may require extensive air and artillery preparations prior to the ground attack. Supporting fires suppress defender's fire, restricts his movement, and possibly destroys his position. Consideration should be given to the rubbling effect produced by aerial and artillery bombardment. The assault should closely follow air and artillery fire to exploit its immediate effect on the defender. Maneuver units move near the final coordination line while the enemy is engaged by supporting fires. As the attacking force assaults supporting fires, lift and or shift to block enemy withdrawal or to prevent the enemy from reinforcing their position. In chapter 4, it also goes into avoiding civilians, ironically, on page 4-8. The use of aerial delivered ordnance may be restricted by ROE, rules of engagement, because of the presence of civilians or the requirement to preserve key facilities within the city. However, we can still see several cases of bombings of civilians by US airplanes and drones particularly. Not to mention it also ignores the possibility of such actions pushing the civilians to begin resisting an attacking force through multiple means. You may have noticed I haven't mentioned lessons learned by the Soviet Union yet. According to James S. Coram's The Spanish Civil War Lessons Learned and Not Learned by the Great Powers, the Soviets learned much from these bombardments by starting to make changes to their production around particularly of their aircraft. If I wasn't blocked by a paywall or limited previews, I could quote this exactly. However, this stuck out to me most noticeably in the short time I had to read it. The Soviets started to focus much more on CAS or close air support and cooperation between ground units on the battleground than a simple strategic bombing campaign. Although there were issues that slowed down this change, once implemented, it turned out to be very effective. The Germans would also apply this as well with the Stuka and its siren particularly. <laughs> However, noticeably continued to carry out more bombings on civilian targets. The focus on close air support attacks had a much more effective means of affecting morale. As Mount notes on page 48, airstrikes can reduce or destroy vital supplies and facilities supporting the enemy. The resulting shock, concussion, and psychological effects of such an attack can reduce the effective and fighting spirit of an enemy force. The Soviets had some limited strategic bombing that some have argued that they lacked bombers for such a mission, but as we can see this was a conscious effort to focus more on close air support having studied the lessons of the Spanish Civil War, and therefore have not focused on strategic bombing supplies and planes. The Soviets also learned about armored tactics and their tank designs due to them not only sending tank crews and advisors but also several T-26 tanks. 
The reports first noted a lack of HE or high explosive ammunition and the danger of anti-tank guns like the Beaufort's 37mm. This resulted in an ammo and armor thickness increase in tank requirements, along with a focus on sloped armor for their tanks. They also learned, particularly from urban combat, the danger such an environment would pose to a tank particularly. Tank designs would also include ramming capabilities against barricades or other obstacles. Increased gun elevation and MG elevation from the turrets and also rear machine guns to several designs of their tanks. Thank you for watching and if you liked today's video leave a like and if you'd like to see more content from me hit the subscribe button and that bell.